So I'm guessing we're all here for Photography Basics and I, and I sure appreciate you coming. Um, this is a, uh, an Evergreen Camera Club T&T presentation. Um, T&T stands for Tips and Techniques and uh, we also have general meetings. Hang on a second. There we go. Uh, in the general meetings, these are the next ones that are coming up. Um, Evergreen Camera Club has meetings on the second Wednesday and also the fourth Wednesday of each month. So the second Wednesday of the month is the general meeting. And then uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month is a tips and techniques meeting, which is typically more technical or hands-on. And that's, um, uh, that's what, uh, what, what we do, except for a couple, a couple of months, like for instance, Christmas and stuff, we don't have a tips and techniques in December. Uh, so today's September 23rd, and so that's uh, my presentation. October 5th, 14th will be Scott Wilson, and his uh, general meeting will be a personal journey towards photo advocacy. Scott Wilson is a Scott, Scott born, and he is um, a cancer survivor. So he has taken, um, the, uh, the experience that he had as a cancer survivor and is um, and has has changed his way he looks at photography. Then we've got Rick coming up on October 28th and Rick is actually here tonight so so thank you Rick Rick Noel and he has created a photo app and he would like some feedback from us and he's going to present his photo app. And finally uh, November 11th is Glenn Randall. And it is the presentation that he is giving is take a walk on the wide side, which is about panoramas. Uh, you might want to Google Glenn Randall. He just had a brand new book come out on landscape photography that is absolutely amazing. So just just to let you know about about Glenn, I, I think he's in Boulder. So it just gives us uh, gives you an idea of uh, what we got coming up for the next four uh, meetings. And also, um, here's our calendar, the Seasons of Our Mountain calendar. This is the first year that Evergreen Camera Club uh, has teamed up with Mount Evans on their iconic Seasons of Our Mountains calendar. Uh, we just launched it last week and we're really proud of it. Uh, Lori, who's on the call today, has a really nice photo of a bear in the calendar. I've got a photo of a fox. Uh, Lori, that's the ermine we were talking about. Um, and uh, so just keep your eye out in Evergreen. We, it'll be in uh, retail stores and also keep an eye out for our website. We'll have a link uh, so you can do uh, an online purchase. So let's get going here. I've got a little bit of an Ellen show for you since uh, I share the name Ellen with a more famous Ellen. Uh, I've been doing photography for a really long time. This is me as a teenager. Um, I get a kick out of that leisure suit in this, in this photo. And I love the fact that I have my non-shooting eye open. So look at, even at an early age, I, I had that, that good habit of, of having my eye open. That's, I, I always thought that was pretty funny. That's obviously a film camera. And here I am in, in college in a dark room. I worked my way through college as a photographer. I actually have a degree in engineering, but, um, but my, my love has always been photography. So I'm, I'm thrilled that I'm able to, to be a photographer full time. Uh, here's some recent uh, published photos that uh, I was a cover of Colorado Life Magazine. This is my image that's called New Kids on the Rock. And um, Tom actually was with me when I, uh, when I photographed this, Tom and also Leslie Hample. And Tom likes to say that he has the same exact shot. So you go, Tom, that, that, that you also have, have this photo. It's actually, this is only uh, half of the actual photo that goes more to the right and, you, and you'll see it coming up. This is, um, um, Colorado Serenity Magazine, this is just from March. And this is before social distancing became a thing. But I uh, got, this is actually a husband and wife team of um, optometrists. And I thought this was pretty funny that they wanted to sit so that we could see the fireplace in the photo. 
Um, I'm also honored to be um, selected. So my images are on a signal box in downtown Golden. Uh, it's a four-sided five foot tall signal box. And here I am with the two of the sides right behind my shoulder. And then also on the other side, it's right across from um, Starbucks downtown. If, if you wanna go check it out. And uh, I had to reimagine my headshot business. Uh, so I bought a tent. It's a 10 by 10 kind of art fair tent and easy up. And um, it, it, does a, it does a pretty good job. So I've been doing, I take my studio lights outside and I've been photographing headshots. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it looks pretty good. And I don't think it looks like uh, this guy's outside. So I, I, I like to think I'm pretty successful, but there is one challenge and that is if the wind comes up, um, that can make for an, uh, you know, a, a lot of photoshopping. I really had to work on, th these are two different photos, by the way, but I had to, obviously, but I had to do a lot of uh, photoshopping to get his hair to lay down for the, for the final image. Also, I, um, I have a degree, I'm a, a certified professional photographer, and uh, that's something that's done through PPA, uh, Professional Photographers of America. And my next goal is to get my master's of photography. Here is one of the images that I'm gonna submit for my master's and it's called Cosmic Calm. So you can see this uh, Milky Way shot. So let's talk about our goal tonight. Um, really, you know what it boils down to? It boils down to what makes a good photo. And, and that's these five elements, uh, exposure, focus, lighting, composition, and post-processing. You know, it's interesting um, that I have post-processing in here, but if you don't post, if you don't know how to post-process, then um, you're missing a good part of, of what you can do to really make your image stand out. And so I think that that's, uh, that's, that's worth talking about. But first we need to know your camera, because if you don't know your camera, then, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the starting point. And by the way, it can even be your phone that, you know, that, that makes, that takes pictures too. So, so um, first off, it helps to know what kind of uh, camera you have and also the size of your sensor. As you can see in this photo, um, the, the smaller the sensor, the less information you're catching. So capturing, so the one inch, that's all that particular camera can see at this point. I like to think if, if there were four of us, one with each camera, the 35 millimeter, um, can you see my uh, cursor if I do this? Is that okay? Nod your head, Lori, can you see that? Okay, thank you. Um, so if I have a 35 millimeter or a full frame camera, I see this whole image. And then this is the APS-C or DX crop sensor. And this is all that camera sees. If we're all shoulder to shoulder with um, the same lens. And so you can see the micro four thirds and a one inch sensor. This person with the one inch sensor is either gonna to have to get a wider angle lens or step back to get the same shot that I get with my full frame. So that just gives you an idea and you need, so, so that's step one is to know what, how big your sensor is because that'll help you in, in making your determinations and how, how to photograph uh, your subject. So also you can uh, um, decide whether or not you want a mirror camera, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. There's a lot of reasons, uh, there's a lot of pros and cons with each way. Um, the mirrorless cameras are, are thinner and lighter. And you can see that on the right as the Sony Alpha. And um, it's more compact. I mean, the, it, it uses a phase detection uh, focusing versus contrast detection. So there's some, there, there's some definite advantages to going mirrorless, but there's a lot more lenses because it's a, it's a longer, you know, the system's been around for a long time if you go with a DSLR. So just, you know, the, here again, these are questions you need to ask yourself. On your camera, typically, unless you have a point and shoot that uh, is just essentially like your phone, you likely will have an at the top on a dial, an A, an S, an M, and a P. 
Uh, a is a uh, is typical, and uh, a lot of cameras use it. It's also with Nikon. A V is a Canon um, a nomenclature. That's your aperture priority, and that's if aperture is most important to you. S is shutter priority, M for manual, and P for program mode. If you have um, a point and shoot, you might also have a mountain, and that would be for landscape, a flower for macro, and a runner for sports. So these are just ways uh, to tell your camera what your subject's going to be and, and what settings you're going to need. So um, if depth of field is important to you, then, um, then you might want to go with aperture priority. And oops, I got a little AV that kind of fell behind this, this cute little uh, kitten here, Lynx kitten. Uh, but if stopping the action is more important for the image, then use shutter priority. So then you're controlling the shutter speed. You're controlling the speed of, of capturing the image versus uh, aperture where you're controlling the light that is going through the lens. Here's uh, automatic or program mode versus manual. What the camera's doing in the upper photo is it's, it's, it's taking averages. It's trying to calculate what the proper exposure is. But in something like a sunrise or a sunset, there's too much contrast, or there's, I'm sorry, there's, there's a lot of difference between the very dark and the very light. And usually it does not do a good job of guessing uh, or determining the exposure. So you might want to go with manual in a situation such as a sunrise or a sunset. Program mode is when the camera decides what, um, what the best exposure is. Usually it does a pretty good job. Also, you, the, a decision that you need to make is whether or not to shoot uh, JPEG versus RAW. And I would recommend, and you can see all these pros and cons, I would recommend uh, that you shoot RAW um, because, uh, well, just, just as an example, JPEG records 256 levels of brightness, whereas RAW records between 4,096 and 16,384 levels. It's like kind of having a little box of crayon or a big box of crayons. I mean, which, which do you want to have? Um, by the way, on the back of the screen, if you just took a photo and then you're looking at the back of the screen, that is always a JPEG, whether you are in RAW or JPEG. So um, keep that in mind when you're, um, when you're looking at the back of the camera. Here's an example of my, um, uh, what I can do because I have more information with a raw file. Um, you're able to recover things that, that you didn't think were possible. I mean, if you look at this little chickadee on the left, it's, it, it looks like a throwaway photo. It's just not very good, but by, by doing a uh, couple of sliders and modification, you, the, the data is actually really there. It just needed a little help with post-processing to get it. So uh, those are the kinds of things that, that you can, uh, that you're able to do with a raw file versus a JPEG. By the way, to, to do this, I just, uh, this was in Lightroom and I just hit the auto button. I didn't do much to it at all, just, just to prove a point. So you might say to yourself, well, so all this information, all these choices, what is the best camera? Well, I like to say it's the one you have with you. And for most of the time, for most of us, it's your phone. So I want to real quickly go through some of the phone apps that are out there. If that's all you have and that's what you're using, then um, uh, you know, you're better off than a lot of people. Um, here's a couple of phone apps uh, that I that I use. Uh, the one on the left, Procam 6, is for the iPhone, and Open Camera is for the Android, and it gives you more controls. It gives you aperture and shutter speed and ISO and shoots in RAW. Um, so these are all these are, are highly rated. And here's an example of what um, what I did. Okay, this was before I I now have an 11, but uh, before I had the 6S, and this was on the left is with the built-in camera, 
and then I switched out, you know, and the photo was stinky. So that's a technical term, by the way, to have a stinky photo. Um, so I switched over to my app for ProCam and look at the difference. I mean, you know, because it's, it's just got, you have much more control. Also good old post-processing. Um, Snapseed is really highly rated and really easy to use if uh, you want to check out Snapseed. Lightroom Mobile is a great app. And if you have Lightroom, then you automatically get Lightroom Mobile. Another fun thing to play with is slow shutter. And uh, you can do something called intentional camera movement, ICM. And uh, here's, here's an example. Uh, these, these are also not retouched. They're just straight out of the camera of, of, uh, from my phone. I said straight out of my phone of um, intentional camera movement. Also, some of my favorite apps that are, um, that are worth buying, especially if they're free, uh, Photo Pills. I use that, that's kind of a celestial um, calculator and it's very, very powerful. And I have to admit it has so much information. You can kind of get in the weeds with that one, but it's, it's a fantastic um, app. It costs, I think it costs $9.99. iNaturalist is great for uh, identifying wildlife and uh, plant life, especially when you just photograph something and you want to know what was that. <laughs> Uh, and finally, Peak Finder. If you don't have Peak Finder, especially around here, and you just photographed um, a mountain, you know, the, a ridge line or something, and go, what are those mountains? You can put Peak Finder, you put your phone with Peak Finder on up showing that ridge line, and boom, it gives you, it lists the names of all the peaks around you. So if, if you don't have that one, that one's, I think it's like three bucks. So it's, it's definitely worth Worth, uh, worth looking into. Okay, let's keep going with your camera uh, lenses. Um, if, uh, de depending on your camera and all, um, you may have fixed, you may have just one lens that you're never able to change out on your camera, or you may be able to change um, uh, to one of many different lenses. Here we go, here, here are a bunch of Nikon lenses. Can you tell I'm a Nikon girl? Cause I keep using Nikon examples. Um, so this is from the super telephoto on the left down to a wide angle at, on the far right. And that just gives you an idea of, of some of your options, uh, whether it's a zoom lens, which has multiple focal lengths or a prime lens, which is just one focal length, such as a 50 millimeter. And that's all it is, is a 50. Um, I went down, I mentioned earlier, I went down to the lake this morning um, just to kind of show, show what I could do with uh, all my different lenses. I think somebody was probably thinking, it's like, what is she shooting? Because it's not a very good shot. <laughs> but um, anyway, this is the 16 millimeter and you can see that you see everything. Um, uh, but you can also, with a wide angle, Practically everything is in focus. You can sort of see that rock in the foreground's in focus and everything in the background's in focus. That's the nature of a wide angle lens. Um, it's, uh, it, it, uh, it kind of flattens out mountains in the distance too. So, you, so it's a trade-off. You've got, you know, it's, it's not all that exciting a lens for trying to get a landscape in the distance. Uh, there are tricks to make uh, mountains look bigger in post-process. But for the most part, you know, you, this, is, this is just a wide angle of, of the shot. By the way, if you happen to be getting a group shot and you've got a whole line of people left to right, everybody is just standing shoulder to shoulder in a line, don't be that person on the end because a wide angle lens distorts as you get to the edges and you are gonna look a lot wider on the end than you would if you were one of the people in the middle. So jockey for one of those middle spots if some photographer is shooting a group with a wide angle lens. Here's 24 millimeter. I'm gonna go back to the 16 so you can see the 16 again. And here's the 24 so you can see I'm a little bit closer. And I think the mountains look less flattened. This is a 50 millimeter lens. It's also called the normal lens because it's said that uh, that's how we perceive with our eyesight is normal, normal vision is a 50 millimeter lens. 
standard lens is uh, 70 millimeters and um, we're getting a little bit closer. Uh, we've got a little bit more detail in the distance. Here's a 135 that's called considered a short telephoto. We've lost the ridge line, uh, but we gain detail on the, on the lake house. This is a 200 millimeter, so we're getting even closer. 300 millimeter, closer still. And a 500 millimeter, and we're getting to see the entire lake house. So that gives you an idea of what each of the lenses can do for you. By the way, you need to be very careful with longer lenses. Um, you can just imagine when you've got something that is so magnified, the shakiness of the camera is also magnified. And you don't want to, uh, to have your shutter speed so slow that camera shake becomes an issue. And I've actually got a slide of that coming up. So um, that's just uh, something to, to be thinking about when we hit the next uh, the slide about that later. Also, um, one thing I didn't mention was a macro lens. This is, um, have you ever tried to photograph something, but you couldn't, um, you couldn't focus on it because you were too close? It's almost like your camera needs a pair of readers. You're farsighted. Um, that's kind of what macro lenses does. It allows you to photograph very close up. And, um, and so that's, that's an option if you're interested in photographing birds or butterflies. Well, um, actually not birds, unless you're really close up. Bugs, I mean, and butterflies, you can um, uh, use a macro lens. I really enjoy macro lenses. It's like uh, for photographing abstracts and all. Okay, let's go to our photographic basics. So what exactly makes a good photo? I'd say it all boils down to these elements. Um, I don't know if you've seen this before. This is kind of a famous photography diagram. It's a Venn diagram of the elements of exposure where you've got the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. And if you raise one, you've got to lower the other to make it to get to the perfect exposure. Um, so, so you can see that all of them work together just to get the right amount of light onto your sensor. So let's start with shutter speed. Um, just kind of think about shutter speed and you go, okay, what do I want to do? The shutter speed is the amount of time that the shutter is open and therefore light is hitting the sensor based on the time of, of having your shutter open. So what is your desired outcome? Do you want to stop the action? Do you want to blur the action? Do you not care what the shutter speed is just as long as, as your aperture is the right exposure for what you want? I mean, these are all things that you need to decide um, or leave it up to the camera, leave it on program mode and hope for the best. Um, I'm going to take a little side trip here and talk about focus. Uh, because focus is a part of shutter speed in a sense. Um, it, uh, and aperture, by the way. First off, here's an example of motion blur. And you can see, and it's, it's obvious, that this fox is out of focus because it was moving too fast. Not the fact that uh, I was just lousy at focusing. Uh, and you can tell that indicate that by the fact that the grass is in focus and the and the tree trunk in the background is in focus but the little little running fox is out of focus um, so that's so that's how you could tell and um, and so I know looking at this and you can see my exposure in the lower left hand corner that I now know that one six hundred and fortieth of a second and that's down down here one six fortieth of a second is too slow for a running fox. I'm gonna to have to up my shutter speed. And therefore, by upping my shutter speed, I'm also probably gonna to have to increase my ISO because I'll be letting le less light in through the, through the shutter. So I'm gonna to have to make my sensor more sensitive or I'm gonna to have to open up my aperture. Um, so let's say your, your photo is out of focus. Why is it out of focus? Well, first off, you may have just missed your focus. The focus, uh, you were focusing either before or, or behind the, um, 
especially if the object is moving. You could have had too slow a shutter speed. You could have had camera shake, which is you just, you know, you just holding your camera and the act of pushing the shutter makes the, the camera body shake just a little bit. If you are consistently out of focus, especially like in one particular lens, it's very possible that it just needs to be calibrated. And uh, that's a thought. In fact, I just had a, a lens recently get out of calibration and I had to buy a uh, lens calibrator and get my, which, which was, you know, 60 bucks. And it, uh, and it turned out that I was two inches in front of what I was focusing. So that may be all it is. You know, if you think to yourself, oh, I just can't get a photo in focus. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's a calibration issue or you just have too slow a shutter speed. Here's just some uh, quick ideas for uh, action and shutter speeds. I've, um, I photograph hummingbirds. If I can get it to, depending on the lighting conditions, if I can get it to one four thousandth of a second, I will get to try to stop those hummingbird wings. Birds in flight, um, a little bit, you know, half, half the amount of time. Going down to non-moving subjects, maybe one one twenty-fifth. If you are really steady and you can hold your your camera, depending on what lens you have, um, non-moving subjects, one one twenty-fifth, um, one sixtieth of a second. Um, if I have to, I can hold really really steady at a fortieth of a second. But you've got to know what you're, you know, you got to know that you're that um, that slow a shutter speed so that you don't shake the camera because your camera movement will move and reflect on, your, on what your photo looks like. Here's my philosophy on shutter speed. And, and this is uh, the, the first bullet is actually what I was talking about a little bit earlier. So if you have a 500 millimeter lens, you probably should not have your shutter speed at any time less than one over the millimeters or focal length of that lens. So I've got a, a 500 millimeter lens and I try never, ever, ever to have it at less than one 500th of a second. Um, of course, if you're on a tripod, that's different, but I'm talking about handheld. Um, and if you have, if, if you have room to, to play, then always try to have your shutter speed faster than what you need. Um, also, the fact that oncoming subjects do not, do not need as fast a shutter speed uh, as images that are going across the frame. I've got a photo of that uh, that's coming up. And also, if, if, if your photo is blurred, then just say you were being artistic. Here's uh, stopping the action. Um, it uh, uh, was at uh, one thousandth of a second to catch this. Um, and I got a really nice sort of trail, water trail from uh, this uh, female elk on the, at the lake. Here's, uh, this is purposely blurring the action. So you can see in this, I'm at 1 40th of a second. And you can see my, my aperture, my F22 f-stop is, um, is really, really high because I, I'm trying to get, because it's in the middle of the day, and, and I'm, I'm working on that dance where I need to have my ISO as low as I possibly can. And, and I, I definitely need my shutter speed at a 40th of a second to get this kind of effect. And uh, so therefore I had to have my aperture really, really, uh, you know, a tiny, tiny aperture so that I would get the right amount of light uh, hitting the sensor. Here's, uh, here's my comment about the, um, um, uh, whether or not I, um, whether the focus, or I'm sorry, whether the, whether the shutter speed needs to be the same or um, with a subject going from left to right or right to left versus coming straight at you. And so here's, here's my husband actually on our street and you can see that at F8, and one 250th of a second, he's blurry. So this is not fast enough to, to stop the action because the subject is moving all the way across the sensor. 
So this is the same camera setting, but now he's just coming straight at me because the subject is only using up that little bit of a sensor coming from back to front, you can get away with a slower shutter speed. And so that's just the nature of, um, of the, um, of, uh, the way the sensor works and photographing with that kind of shutter speed. By the way, where do you focus? Um, you wanna focus, if you're focusing on a person or an animal, anything with eyes, you want to focus on the eyes. Um, in fact, it is psychologically disturbing to have the eyes out of focus. So always try to focus on the eye of a subject that has eyes. All right, let's talk about aperture. That is also known as an f-stop. And just to let you know, uh, back in the old days, what what is the word, I'm gonna give you the uh, origin of the word f-stop. Um, they used to have to put these metal plates in front of the lens and that was called a stop because you were stopping the light and each one was a different focal length. So that's the f, f in f-stop is focal and then stop because you were stopping the light with these metal plates that they were putting in front of their lenses. And so that's where that, that word came from. Um, if you were to look at your lens straight on when you are, um, actually, actually, I'm not even sure. I don't think you can do this anymore because, uh, uh, because of, uh, everything is now digital and it's, it's an electronic shutter as opposed to a mechanical shutter, but you can see just how much light is going in through F 1.4. That's, that's a, a very wide aperture and we're getting smaller and smaller as we go down. Just imagine how the light going through the F 1.4 is just being scattered everywhere. So it's just not focusing in. The light is just all over the place. Whereas at F, F8, the light is now more focused and that therefore gives you a more focused subject. And that's what aperture and depth of field is all about. Here's another uh, way to look at it. With the aperture wide open, you're letting in more light. And with an aperture, the diaphragm blades tightening up, then that's a smaller aperture and that's letting in less light. So that leads us to depth of field. And that's essentially what is in focus. Here's an example. Um, of, of why you would want to understand what depth of field is in the photograph that you're shooting. Uh, you can see that the cougar on the left has a deep depth of field. You can see all of the branches behind it. You can see the bushes behind it and stuff like that. Is, you need to ask yourself, is that the kind of photo that I want? Do I want all these branches to be in focus? Or, so that's with a deep depth of field on the left, or would you rather have the shallow depth of field on the right where you pretty much just see the cougar and you're not distracted by branches. Now this, admittedly, these are two different trees uh, with the cougar, but, um, but it still illustrates the point that at F8 and at 70 millimeters, you've got a, a much deeper depth of field, more in focus from front, front to back, as opposed to a shallower depth of field that allows you and the viewer and your eye to go straight to the subject and not be distracted by all sorts of other things in the photo. Um, this is a, I don't even, I can't remember. I think, oh, I think this is a barn swallow. Um, little barn swallow on a tree and I'm at F22. And so with that tiny, tiny little aperture, everything is in focus. You can see the branches behind it. It's, it's distracting. You don't really want to have that much information on um, with with the bird. Um, and I don't care about the twigs. That's that's not my subject. My subject is the bird. So a really a better idea is to change my aperture to f 5.6. Now look at how that now the because the depth of field is more shallow, there's no longer this massive amount of of 
twigs behind it. It's it's much more subdued. And for me, my in my taste, it makes for a much better image. Um, and I don't care to have these twigs that are distracting the background. But then another thing to do is to just be aware of the fact that you had twigs in the background and just move a little bit over to the left. And then you don't have to worry about having having any distractions. I'm going to go back over this because this is just so important to see this exposure triangle. This is another illustration of it. Um, a good reminder that's showing that as your ISO on the left, as that increases, your sensor becomes more sensitive to light and your photo will get brighter. And so on the right, with your shutter speed, if your shutter speed goes down and there's more time light hitting the sensor, then your image gets brighter. Or with the aperture, if you change your aperture so that it goes to a bigger aperture, such as f2.8, it's letting in more light and your photo is getting brighter. So with all of those things, um, you get to decide which of those um, which of these settings do you want to work together to create your perfect exposure? I'm going to go back. I was talking earlier about photo pills. Um, I'm just going to give you, this is one of the um, parts of photo pills. And I'm um, just going to give you a little bit of math. Don't panic. It's not going to be for long. This, uh, I'm setting up all of the information uh, as far as I have a 105 millimeter lens. I'm going to be at f8. I'm 16 feet 5 inches from the subject. And it's doing all the calculations for me. And it's telling me that my depth of field down here is 3 feet 6 and a half inches. Here's a better way to look at it to see it in pictures. Um, so uh, here's that those same settings up here and also here. So it's showing you for a, a a subject that's, um, you know, as far as having a tree and, and your distance from the tree and what's going to be in focus. And then also for a, a person and here's your 16.5 subject distance from your camera to the person. And then here's that three feet, six inches. So you've got this much in front of the person in focus and this much behind the person in focus or 1.7 uh, one foot seven inches in front and one foot 11 inches behind. So that helps to helps you to understand the math of what is in focus based on, in, in this particular instance, on uh, an aperture of F8. Here's another example of my new kids on the rock. Here's the whole photo because you saw half of the photo earlier. Um, and you can see that um, this, this was shot in 2018, and you can see that I was at f6.3 using 110 millimeters, which was actually my zoom lens, my um, 70 to 200 millimeter lens. So I was at 110 at the time at a, uh, 1 1600th of a second, so it stopped the action, and I was at ISO 200. Um, and I like the fact that you can see the mountain goat kids and not really be distracted by the background. I feel that the subject is the mountain goat kids, not the background. But I had an opportunity to shoot later and I, um, went, I, I changed my exposure so that I could see what it was like if I did have more depth of field, more mountains in the background. And you know what, it's personal taste as, as to which of the two you like better. Um, but this is a 78 millimeters, so it's it's a little bit of a shorter focal length. And f9 versus, and I'm going to go back one, uh, f6.3. So um, so it just gives you an idea of of you know essentially the same place, roughly the same shot, two different um, apertures, totally different look to the photo. So um, like I said, these are all things for you to be thinking about when you're um, when you're deciding how you want your photo to look. Okay, now let's talk about ISO, which is not in search of. By the way, it, um, it stands for 
International Standards Organization, and it used to be ASA. So if you remember back in the old film days, it was ASA. And you may also remember DIN. Um, they combined those back in 1974. And then it's been revised a bunch of times, like in 1987 and stuff like that. But it's an international standards. And it, it, what it does digitally is it makes your sensor more sensitive to light. And it allows you to capture in dark images. But of course, there's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. And um, high ISO images are noisier. So what you want to do, your desired outcome, is to have your ISO as low as you possibly can and still have a, a decent exposure for your subject. Here's a great example. Can you see that uh, on the left, ISO is 100? And on the right, ISO is 3200. And can you see all the little, just it's grainy, it's noisy. This is not going to be near as quality a photo as this one on this side at ISO 100. If, if you think to yourself, it's like, okay, well, I'm really interested in uh, what my camera will do. I would recommend uh, if you go online and just Google the name of your camera and then also uh, ISO test you should be able to come up often with um, um, somebody's already done the work for you. So you don't have to do it again. Although you may be interested in, in, in trying what all, um, all the different ISOs are and how your image looks based on that. I got this off of Photography Life for my camera in particular. I have a Nikon D850. And um, here's ISO 64, which is the lowest my camera goes. That's called essentially base ISO. And then here's ISO 100, 200, 300, all pretty much looks at, or 400. As you can see that you're doubling, by the way, 100 doubled is 200, 200 doubled is 400, 400 doubled is 800. It's still, it's still, you know, you almost can't tell a difference, right? Um, 1600. I'm starting to see a little bit. I don't know how you can, you know, with the zoom and stuff and, and what kind of resolution you have on your, on, on uh, your end, but 1600 is roughly as high as I personally will go with a camera, with an image that I want, let's just call it gallery quality image. Um, I know that that's because of, of tests like this that I've seen just Googling around. That that's, that that's kind of my limit. Here's an example. Can you see, now I've gone way up. I've gone to 12,800. But can you really see how grainy that is? And then how about that one? That's 10, 102,400. So you can see that this, you know, this obviously is not a, a quality image. Um, when I go out and shoot um, prairie chickens, all the really fun action happens before dawn. And so I'm up at ISO 2500, et cetera. And I, this is noisy to me. I, I wouldn't be able to blow this up and, and it be an image that I'd be proud of or try to sell in the galleries. Uh, there's also a lot of cameras have an auto ISO and that will um, make the ISO decision for you. So you can uh, look at that research that and see if that's uh, a, a setting that you have in your camera. Another thing on the back of your camera, hopefully you have a histogram. And the histogram, uh, I'm just, okay, so histograms can also be an RGB, which is red, green, and blue, to show um, also those channels. But I'm just going to do this, I'm going to simplify this to just be talking about essentially black and white histogram. Um, you can see that in the histogram, far left is all of your darks. And then moving from left to right, you, you're, you have a representation of your shadows, your midtones, your highlights, and your whites. What this essentially is, is the 256 different tonal values of your image. Remember that 256 we were talking about JPEGs? That's what... Uh, that's where it's all tying back together. So if I have an image with a lot of shadows in it, 
then my uh, histogram will be over more to the left. And if I have an image with a lot of whites in it, or if it's overexposed, then I will have more, um, more data on the right of my histogram. So hopefully looking at the back of your camera, you've got, um, you're looking at your histogram and you can see that down there. There it is. And you can also see that my uh, that I have too many whites and my whites are jamming up against the uh, the right side of the histogram that tells me that I have lost detail in my whites, which are the highlights. Let's say I've got white clouds. Some of the whites in the clouds, the detail in the clouds just went all like whoosh, whoosh, all white instead of um, you know, the, just the detail that you would, would actually see in the clouds. So I know that I need to fix my exposure because I am too far to the right. You can also see by looking at the photo that my preview, this is a JPEG, don't forget that. Um, my JPEG also looks blown out. It looks overexposed. And so that's a pretty good hint too. Um, so, uh, so I changed my exposure. This is a different image, obviously, no longer the little deer. Um, and you can see that this is, this is a better representation of a histogram. We don't have anything jamming up on the left or the right side of the histogram. And also by looking at the JPEG, it's, um, you, can, you can see that there's, um, that, you know, that's the good, good first step is looking at the JPEG and, and, but also just don't forget to look at the, um, uh, the histogram because that is really um, your true indicator of how your exposure is. If you've got a difference between your histogram and, and your JPEG LCD, trust the histogram. And that's right there. Here's another representation of what a good histogram looks like where it's not crashing up against the left or the right. By the way, if you have it going off the top, um, that's called clipping. Actually go either left or right. If, you, if you've lost, um, if, if your histogram is going all the way over to the right, um, then you're clipping the uh, highlights. If the histogram is going all the way off to the left, you're clipping the details in the shadows and the blacks. So um, look for those kinds of things and make sure that you haven't um, lost that detail. Back in the olden days, um, back in the film days anyway, um, you kind of, sometimes you had to guess at exposures and this was, I, I thought this was fun to bring this up. They called that the, the sunny 16 rule. And that was just knowing that if you had an ISO of 100, then you should have one one hundredth of a second as your shutter speed and F16. So that kind of gives you a rule of thumb back for back in the old film days. Just a little bit more on exposures. Um, this is kind of just showing how everything goes together. The, the top two rows are um, your depth of field at the very top and then your apertures. And you can see moving from left to right that as your aperture gets bigger, your depth of field gets blurrier with the little um, red man. Also going from left to right in the third row, those are your ISOs and you can see as your ISO gets more sensitive to light, it also gets grainier. So, um, your ISO 51200 is much grainier than an ISO of 100. And then finally, going from left to right, as you're getting a slower, slower shutter speed, you're getting blurrier and blurrier. By the way, just talking real quick about equivalent exposures, if you double your exposure time, you must have the amount of light hitting your film or sensor. And here's just a little bit of an illustration about that, where you're um, taking away light from your aperture, therefore you have to have a longer shutter speed. 
Oh, you know what? I'm kind of like saying the same thing over and over, but in different ways. So hopefully those will all kind of, um, one of them will make sense to you and will click, or hopefully all of them will make sense. The other thing we need in photography is light. Uh, the best time to shoot is a uh, sweet light, um, also called like the golden hour. There's the blue hour. That's right around dawn and dusk. If you're shooting in the middle of the day, look for even shade because you really don't want harsh shadows or maybe it's a, a thin layer of clouds. Here's the golden hour. And here is the blue hour. So as the sun is setting or either setting or rising, light has to go through more air and that's why you get more dramatic lighting at that time of day. Here's some harsh shadows. And, uh, but you know, harsh, harsh light isn't all that bad. You've got a nice rim light around these uh, little goslings. So, uh, you know, this makes for a dramatic photo. Also use the shadows to tell a story or to add depth. These are all kind of rule breakers and it, uh, but that's what, that's what adds to your personal style as a photographer. If you're photographing people on portraits, you do not want modeled or uneven lighting. You can see this, um, uh, you know, you see how like there's bright spots on some people's faces and dark spots and some people are in shadow. And this is just a disaster. I, um, I had to do a little bit of waiting. I could see that the clouds were coming and I, if, just just by being a little patient, we can see the one guy off. Uh, can you see this guy in the dark red shirt? I don't think he's too happy about me doing a little song and dance. But it all paid off. And you can see that this kind of lighting is is obviously much more attractive. And so be aware of of how you can have even shade, wait for clouds or something so that you get a much nicer photo. Okay, oops, I, I went backwards. Okay, so here's time for a quiz. You guys ready, are y'all awake? Okay, is this overexposed or underexposed? You can think to yourself since I can't hear you. Okay, so it's overexposed. Why? Because everything is off to the right and you clip the whites. Okay, how about this? We got um, the nose and the eyes of this little lynx kitten in focus, but not much else. So do you think this is F4 or F22? It's F4 and, and why? Well, that's because we've got a very shallow depth of field. If I had wanted more in focus, I would need to have a higher aperture, um, you know, such as F8, F11, F16. Here's a hummingbird. Do you think I was at a hundredth of a second or one two fiftieth of a second, 25 hundredth of a second? Okay, so that would be one 25 hundredth of a second because I need to stop action on the wings. Just by looking at the wings immediately, you can see that it had to have been a very fast shutter speed. Here's a photo we actually just looked at um, was that at 100 ISO or 2500 ISO and it's at 2500 because it's noisy or grainy. Okay, we got all your photos now. Let's talk about composition now that our exposures are all good. Well, what makes a good photo? First off, don't forget the basic stuff. You got to say to yourself, well, why am I photographing this? As I, I do a lot of judging. And when I look at a photo, that's the first thing that I think of is like, what interested, what possessed the photographer to want to photograph this in the first place? Is it pretty? Is it, is it interesting? Does it have impact? Um, you got to have the proper exposure. Look at your histogram. Is your horizon straight, by the way, especially in the mountains and stuff? Um, 
try to have your horizon so that you're not tipped one way or the other. Also look to see if anything's distracting in the photo. Also think before you shoot, think about where do you want the viewer's eye to go? Uh, take a visual journey. I'm gonna talk about the rule of thirds and diagonal lines, leading lines and the golden triangle coming up. Okay, so in composition, well, where does your eye go in this image? Does it lead you um, from the rock to the marmot to the background, kind of back to the marmot? Uh, composition does that. And so uh, composition can be pleasing or actually it can also be disturbing. And, and you as a photographer have control over that. First, we'll talk about the rule of thirds. That's just a basic, pleasant um, way to compose your image, just like a tic-tac-toe. Here's uh, four running horses. By the way, often also in composition, uh, there's a rule of odds where things are more pleasing if it's an odd number, but then rules are meant to be broken because this is four horses and I think that, that this is also pleasing. But you can see that I've kind of broken this photo up into thirds. There's the lower third, which is the grass, the middle third, which is the horses, and the upper third, that's the uh, forest in the background. So that's a good example of the rule of thirds. Also, leading lines, you're looking for lines that lead you to the subject. Here you go, can you see this leading line? How about these? So all of these are helping you to, to kind of read the photographer's mind and see uh, what it is that the photographer wants you to enjoy about this photo. It's also kind of the rule of thirds. And, and you may be saying to yourself, why aren't you, why don't you have this in the middle of the, um, of, of this, this square, this rectangle? Things offset are more pleasing than things that are centered. Here's a, um, a bull moose at Evergreen Lake. By the way, I shot this at uh, f5.6. You can still see the house in the background, but it's kind of fun. Also, pretty much the rule of thirds. You can also see the diagonal lines. Um, another, another thing, though, is that you want to give the elk room to breathe in your photos. That's why there's so much empty space off to the right. Also be careful when you're photographing wildlife, not to cut off like the horns at the top of the, the antlers at the, at the top. Somehow, um, you know, if I had cropped it down so that some of the antlers went off the, um, the image, that's not as attractive or, or pleasant. You don't, you don't wanna cut off body parts for the most part. This in this photo, obviously the feet are not showing, but that's implied, so that's okay. Here's an here's a really easy example of leading lines. Certainly, these lines are leading you into the um, the distance with the with the mountains. Um, I shot this honestly. Um, wildfires, the smoke from a wildfire makes for some amazing, uh, spectacular sunrises and sunsets. By the way, I also use photo pills uh, to determine where the sun was gonna set. And that's how I set up so I knew where to, where to take my best shot. We're gonna be talking about this in a little bit under uh, post-processing. This is a Fibonacci spiral or the golden spiral. And that's another way to, um, uh, um, to have a good composition is, is with the, or the golden triangle. Can you kind of see how this sort of swoops around starting with the little goat on the left? It kind of draws your eye around and you kind of rest your eye on this guy. That's, a, that's one way to consider your composition. This is, um, Bill, this is wine for breakfast. So, um, 
something, uh, something I just shot recently. Um, can you see the reflection of the mountains in the wine glasses? That's kind of a special, uh, a special kind of oh wow about this photo. Also, you might be thinking, geez, her windows are clean. No, that was a lot of retouching in Photoshop to get the raindrops and the um, uh, the streaks out of the uh, off of the glass because um, I cleaned the inside of the glass. That was easy. Outside of the glass, not so easy. Couldn't get to it, so I had to Photoshop all the streaks and, and raindrops out. Here's another uh, leading line, golden triangle, kind of spiral your eye around to get to the subject, and it just makes it for a more, a more, more pleasant image. I subscribe to the um, 12 elements of a successful image by the Professional Photographers of America. Some, uh, some of the ones that are important to me, well, certainly you have to have the right exposure, and that's technical excellence and stuff, but impact. Um, the creativity, your style, your composition. A lot of the things that we talked about are, are in this, um, this list of a successful image. Let's put it all together. Let's say you're walking through the woods and you come across a bear, all right? Well, first off, be prepared. If, if you started out, you just left um, the parking lot at the trailhead Check your camera settings. Um, make sure that it's not on your, um, you know, the birthday party that you just photographed inside, somebody blowing out candles or fireworks or something. Make sure that your camera settings are at least close to what you need them to be so that when you do see that bear and you want to photograph them, you're not set on something totally ridiculous or inappropriate for, for that subject. Then take an insurance shot, just, you know, like, okay, maybe the bear is not looking up. At least get a photograph of that bear because that might be the only chance you get. So at least take that first shot, then double check your settings, check your speed, check your f-stop, check your histogram, check your focus. But at least, like I said, at least you have that one shot, that insurance shot. And then start thinking about your composition. Um, is there a trash can in the way? Is there a sign in the way? Is there something you might need to do to, to shift? All of these are considerations for your, um, um, for, for taking the best shot. Also be thinking, what is your desired uh, outcome? Do you wanna get the shot no matter what? Uh, is there a distracting background? Is there movement? Okay, finally, uh, let's talk about post-processing. Now you've got the photos, you're back home. What can you do with them? Here's a cute little chipmunk I photographed on our deck. Trouble is, it got a cable behind him. You know, I, I got to tell you, I asked the chipmunk to move and he didn't. So I said, okay, well, I'll just take that out. So, you know, uh, Photoshop, other post-processing programs, they give you those that the power to change your image once um, once you bring it into the um, some some of the different programs such as Photoshop or Lightroom. How about this? This is a pretty cool shot of a cougar that I got. Well, I cropped this image. This is um, this is not the whole photo. Um, my apologies for anybody who's squeamish, but this is what the whole photo looks like. Um, uh, so you might have the power to crop an image because this is, this is not going to sell in the gallery. <laughs> okay, this can sell in the gallery, not with a dead elk in the, off to the right. Um, also, there was a stick. I don't know if you remember here. I'm going to back up. Can you see the stick in front of the cougar? That's also gone. So, you know, there are things you can do that, that can totally salvage an image uh, based on, on what you do in post-processing. Here's, uh, here's that one photo that I showed you earlier. Um, the one on the left is the before image. And just by doing a couple of sliders in Lightroom, I'm able to really beef up my colors, make it more interesting. Then I... Uh, Took another shot where I really liked the, um, the headlights and I beefed that one up before and after photo so you can see that. 
then through the magic of Photoshop, I um, took the highway of, of uh, the one image and the sunset of the other image and put the two together. So there's all sorts of really cool things you can do if, if you put your mind to, to learning some of these post-processing products. Um, by the way, I used Lightroom and um, also Photoshop. And those are products that you can buy. Uh, it's a monthly subscription now, um, or it has been actually for years, um, except for Tom, right, Tom? Um, and it's uh, $9.99 a month. And that also allows you to get um, the uh, free mobile app. So just, just keep that in mind. So it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a good investment. I'm just going to, I'm going to close with a little bit of inspiration for you all. Um, first, uh, plan your trip. If you, if you're going to go somewhere, you might want to talk to somebody who's familiar with locations. I mean, Bill's going to some cool places. Have you scouted? Have you checked the webcams? Uh, when you go, what do you wear? Usually, uh, this is typically for um, wildlife. Uh, you would want to wear subdued colors. Uh, clothes that match the habitat, avoid white. Um, uh, birds, birds that are um, prey, let me see, am I saying that right? Um, yeah, birds, birds, are, um, birds and animals that are wildlife that are prey are kind of baked in to avoid things that are white. Uh, so uh, white is danger for them, so avoid wearing white. If, you, if you're wearing a goose down jacket or something that just kind of swishes with every step, that may clue in wildlife that you're, that you're there. And also a hat with a bill because there are a lot of animals that are confused about the bill on a hat. They're, uh, they're more wary of round heads such as a cougar head or, or some of the other predators, not necessarily what a a hat with a bill will do, and that may allow you to be more successful. Uh, also, if you see a, a post in Facebook, um, somebody might be giving you the exact location of something really cool, so consider doing something like that. Um, also, you can just Google locations and, and it'll tell you what um, best time of year to go, etc. cetera. Um, Waterton Canyon, is an interesting idea that's down in Denver. Uh, it's plowed in the winter, so you can go pretty much year round, although it was closed for a little while. I'm not sure if it's opened up again because uh, they were doing some stuff with the, um, uh, the um, what is it, the water um, municipality. But here's uh, what Water, water Canyon has bighorn sheep, so that's pretty cool. A lot of action on the dirt road. It's about six miles to go back there and you'll pretty much usually see them just, just hanging out along that road there. Uh, no cars, so you, you, you walk or bicycle. Uh, also Coons Lake in Belmore Park. This is down in Lakewood. Uh, they've got herons, uh, nest building, cormorants, which are really cool. Uh, Coming up real soon, Stern, Par uh, Stern Pond in Stern Park, which is near uh, Old Littleton. Um, this is what I shot there. The uh, reflection is the, uh, just the leaves changing along the, along the shoreline. Make it look like that. There's a merganser. So the others were wood ducks. I was just on Guanella Pass the other day and uh, the leaves were starting to change. Well, actually they changed in some places and not in others. So um, uh, you might want to take a trip up there real soon. They have moose sometimes on Gunella Pass. And that's pretty much it. I want to just let you know that our next ECC meeting is Scott Wilson and it's on October 14th. And if you want to connect with me, um, here's all my cool contact information. And I think that's it. So I'm going to go back to Tom. Ta-da.
Well, all right. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, Thank you. Thank everybody for listening. I appreciate it. I, I do want to just comment. You, you made it sound like I steal Photoshop and Lightroom. I'm not doing the subscription, but I'm not doing it because I bought it years ago and I actually own it. Old versions, but they work. I'm it's not perfectly stealing. It's fine. Um, Ellen, somebody, Scott Major wrote a, uh, a comment. Did you see that in the chat? <laughs> yeah, that's good. The, Scott says, your be prepared tip is true. I was sitting outside a few minutes ago with only my phone camera and this guy landed on the roof next to me. Too bad I didn't have my DSLR. So he's got a photo there. Yeah, it's a great horned owl that landed on the roof right next to me. It just flew right in front of me as I was watching. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> yep, be prepared. I'm Definitely. That's all good. No, the one that, the one that I always seem to get is like I'll be photographing, let's say fireworks the night before, and then I'll see something really cool the next day, and I still have my fireworks settings on my camera, and you know my first shot is like totally wrong. Does anyone else have anything to share or uh, questions? So now, so Bill, you'll be uh, you'll be all set now for your shoot. Oh, yes, right. Everything's packed already. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, well, I hope that was useful, everyone. I had, I had fun putting that one together. I, um, uh, I've, I've, taught, I've taught this class before, or this presentation before, but it, it's always different every time, so I enjoy um, The thing was I a good presentation. Good job, Ellen. Well, yep. thank you.